always felt that the person who I end up with was gonna have to be a rebel in some way because this is not mainstream. Today, we have brought on two people that are literally personifying love with their relationship at some of the highest levels. Welcome, Winston and Mayfair Clements to Hardly Initiated. You have a picture of like what you imagine like your future husband to be. You have a picture of what you imagine your life to be like. And I didn't picture Winston. What does intimacy look like in your relationship? There's no such thing as being good at sex. I would say I'm ready for babies, but he's more no, like- You put him on the spot with that one. Yeah. I, <laughs> I remember preparing for that call by making a list of all the reasons why I thought we wouldn't work. Did you have anybody that was close or special to you that was discouraging you? Yeah, yes. The person who I pick is going to affect the next generation. We just ask, am I happy? And that's an important question. Like, you want to be happy in your relationship, but that can't be the only question that you ask. Welcome to Hardly Initiated. It is your host, Tyshawn Jackson. Here back with another episode, my co-host Ryan Ketchins. I gotta say, man, we are delivering because the people ask for this, and this is what we're giving the people what they want. Man, yeah. we are giving y'all what y'all want because today we have brought on two people that are literally personifying love with their relationship at some of the highest levels. And I'm probably more excited to talk to you guys than I've been for any couple that we have had here I would agree. on the I show agree. today. <laughs> Welcome, Winston and Mayfair Clements to Hardly Initiated. Excited to have you guys. Hey, it's good to be Thank here. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Appreciate We're excited too. Of course, of course. So we got this membership. We got about, uh, I want to say we close to 650. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always ask them who they want to have on the show. So we got quite a few emails with y'all's YouTube and uh, once I saw y'all's channel, I mean, y'all got a popping channel too, by the way. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Y'all got a popping <laughs> channel. But once I saw that, I'm like, yo, we, we got to get this couple on the platform. And, um, you know, it's very difficult to find connection mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us, we even did an episode on this. We have these levels of expectations, which are beyond who we are even yeah. as individuals. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to bring you guys on the show to to give us some game yeah. about how to identify and and maintain true connection and mm -hmm. true love. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so first, let's actually start off with just even the union and how it started. So first, how'd you guys meet? You start now. I'll, I'll start, I'll start. <laughs> so May first slid in my DMs. He no, likes that's to the, say, that's not don't really worry, I'll have my time. <laughs> 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 okay, okay. <laughs> let, let, let me take it a step back. Yeah, so yeah. we actually met at a personal development mm -hmm. event. So in London, yeah. Yeah, so I guess just to kind of give you a backstory, I was in a place where I was in a tech career, but I wasn't really, wasn't really fulfilling me in a way that I, I liked. And so I kind of discovered motivational speaking, and I was on this journey to become a motivational speaker. So I was kind of writing to different events saying, can I come and speak, can I come and share my story, right. and that kind of thing. Um, and so Mayfair's coach at the time was running this personal development seminar, mm. and she put a, a call out for speakers. And I was like, hell yeah, like, I, I wanna go to this thing, I wanna speak. And so um, in the end she said she didn't need a speaker, but she was like, I want you to come to my event anyway. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, should I go, should I not go? Fine, I'll just go, I might meet someone interesting there. And so I show up to this event, I was flustered because I was still in my tech career and doing the speaking on the side. Yeah, so I came like an hour late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm rushing there from work, like, you know, all flustered. And I, I roll into this event and first of all, it was all women. Mm -hmm. It was all women, mostly white women. And then there's me, like little guy rolling in in a wheelchair. And then you have to enter basically on the stage. Mm. Mm. So everyone could see me and it was such like a, I just felt so exposed. Yeah. And then, so we did this whole event, it was really nice, learned a lot. And then I think it was in the networking when I realized that, oh, there is one black lady here. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think, yeah, from my perspective, we were both kind of on a journey of like self-development. I was training to be a life coach at the time. So that's why I had a coach. And that's how we kind of ended up at the same event um, together. But we didn't actually speak at that event. Um, like, I mean, I had noticed him, <laughs> he was late. 
Um, so I was like, yeah, I see you. And I did want to speak to him, but um, I don't know, we just never got round to it. So I think afterwards, and this is where the sliding into the DMs needs to be clarified. But afterwards, we were all tagged in like a picture of everyone that was at the <coughs> event. Um, and he was tagged too. So I was like, okay, let me check this guy out. And I was like, oh, he's really cool. Like he had a TED talk out at the time. So I checked it out and I saw your website and I was like, wow, like you're doing some amazing things. So then I messaged you on Facebook just to be like, hey, sorry we didn't get to chat, but um, you know, it was great to see you basically. So you slid in my DM. Nah, you invited me to lunch though. <laughs> I, it was like a friendly, like, hey, hey. And then he was like, let's go to lunch. Like I'd love to chat more. Um, and that was, the, that was the first time I guess we probably like sat down together. Yeah. After you slid in my DMs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, no, no, listen, 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 fellas, if, if they slide in after the networking event, listen, listen there's mm-hmm. some interest there, all right? Right, right. There's definitely some interest. So you pretty much followed up after the event, yeah. and then you offered to go to lunch. Yeah, which is what I will say as well, like, to women is, I feel like not everyone's comfortable with, like, shooting their shot, which wasn't even what I was on. Like, yeah. I was just trying to grow my business at the time. Like, I wasn't really checking for a relationship but i think you can give a guy a signal that like it's safe to like approach right i always think about like if you're at a bar you don't have to be like hey can i get your number yeah. you can smile like you can do something to be like it's it's safe like to kind of approach so i guess that's what that kind of like was it was like yeah like you know i'm here and then he kind of like invited me to lunch and yeah but so, we were friends for a while so that lunch date obviously goes well uh-huh <laughs> was that was that like business or just like y'all just connecting personally uh, no it was so we i thought we were gonna meet up to talk about business yeah and talk about you know this new journey that we were both on mm-hmm. you was a life coach me as a speaker mm-hmm. but i feel like we spent two hours at lunch just talking about life yeah exactly yeah you know just catching up you know laughing so much and i think for me because, and you guys might relate, when you're on that journey, you're meeting so many people, mm-hmm. right? And you end up having a lot of lunches, a lot of coffees, a lot of phone calls. But this one was different for me because I just left there feeling like, oh my God, that didn't feel like icky or transactional. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just able to be fully myself. And yeah. I think for me also with having a disability, it, making that connection isn't as easy maybe as for the average person. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there's like, perceptions and there's my self-consciousness but i didn't feel like i left that meeting feeling any of that just super light laughter and i just knew that this was someone who was going to be in my life for a long time in some capacity yeah Mm. and we were actually friends for a while like after that lunch like i said we were both in a space of just trying to grow our businesses not really looking for anything serious and i was traveling at the time too so we were friends for a while and then we actually started a business together about a year later uh it was a mastermind for other black entrepreneurs to kind of just share ideas and then i think it was after that that it was like we started spending more time together and i i saw you differently i remember there was like one night we did an in-person event um and it was so weird i was like i don't know it was weird like i, I always just saw you as like a friend but it was like a moment and i was like damn <laughs> mm. what like there's something here mm. um and then I, I guess it was from there that we kind of started exploring yeah that's when the story speeds up yeah <laughs> real fast what what was it that you that you saw was it the leadership that he was displaying during uh, the the business what, yeah. what kind of things was it yeah, it was definitely the leadership i think it was like creating something together and like seeing how well we complemented each other and worked as a team and after that event, uh, this was smooth, by the way. I had a train book to go back to. Um, I was uh, studying for my law degree at the time. So I had a train book to go back that night. And he was like, why don't you just like, you know, stay in London, like we can catch up. I was like, nah, I've got a train booked. He bought me a new train ticket for the next day. And he was like, just stay. So I was like, okay, cool, I'll stay. Um, and we just spoke like pretty much till like, I don't even know, like 4 a.m. Yeah. in the morning um like you shared stuff that you've never shared and i just saw you like for who you were like i feel like i saw his soul and i loved Mm -hmm. it i remember just thinking wow like this is an incredible man i knew he was incredible before like so kind as my friend but it was something that i was like i don't know like how to describe it but it was just in that moment i was like i feel like i really saw him um yeah you know it's interesting because I don't know if a lot of people, I feel like just many of us in this day and age in general, 
we have a very superficial culture mm, and a very yeah. superficial generation as it is. So did you have to just in your own mind struggle or have any limiting beliefs around you being able to, you know, realistically yeah. see, you know, Winston as a real as a as a long term partner in that way when you started feeling that? A hundred percent, because I think um so it was kind of after that, like I thought, oh, like there could be something here. And we kind of spoke. But I, within myself, I was like, because you, you have a picture of like what you imagine like your future husband to be. You have yeah. a picture of what you imagine your life to be like. Um, and I didn't picture Winston. Um, so I really had to like sit with that and be like, okay, cool. Like is, I guess what's that process of separating? I think it's good to have a standard and to know what you want. There's nothing wrong with that. But I had to identify like what part of this standard and what I'm saying I want is society and conditioning and things that everyone else has told me I should want from a man and what part of this is what Mayfair actually wants and needs. Um, so I think that helped and also honestly really just like trusting God. Like it was before we even kind of got together and I communicated my feelings, I kind of just separated myself, cleared out all the noise, like didn't you know, speak to all my girls about, I was like, I, I need to like get like what I want. Cause you can pick a partner based off of what you want right now. But I knew that if I was married, I only wanted to be married one time. So I had to partner with God cause he knows where I'm gonna be in five years. He knows mm -hmm. who I'm gonna need in 10 years mm -hmm. and 15 years and 20 years time. Um, so I think, yeah, there was that initial like struggle of like, like this isn't what I pictured. This isn't what society, you know, tells me is like couple goals. But when I really sat with it, like I had no doubt that this was the man that God had for me. And this is the man that I would do life with and could see me through. Like he had all of the qualities down to a T um, mm. that I knew I would need. Um, and some that I didn't know I'd need, some that mm. I'm still discovering. So there was that balance, but I had to decide, am I going to live? my life based off of what society said I should want, or am I gonna live my life based off of what God, God wants for me and what's important to me? I wanna know how you made those decisions too though, cause I feel like there's some other, you know, young ladies yeah. in that situation where they like Many. sitting down mm -hmm. and they contemplating because what they have doesn't match what they envision yeah, or think that they, they, they want, right? Uh -huh. So what did that, like, was that a series of just isolation and prayer? Was that you talking to your mom or talking to some other women you respect? How did you really manage that decision-making process? Yeah, so definitely number one was like prayer and like putting it to God, like if this is the man that you have for me, then I know you'll figure everything else out and I know I won't miss out. Because there were those fears of like, what will life look like? Like I love to have fun, like be adventurous. Um, and we've been able to do this stuff. Like we went on our honeymoon, like we've gone swimming, like we do all like, we went bike riding together so many things that god has just worked out and he does that like when you actually trust him mm. um and also speaking to women that i trusted and women that i knew were for me um because you have like friends but i i think you know like people in your life like who are really wise and i i knew i had to speak to people who wouldn't look at things on a superficial or a natural level i knew i had to speak to people who could think deeper people who knew me, people who knew what I needed um, and kind of sought their counsel. Um, so those are the two main things, like prayer, seeking counsel from people who I knew I needed and also really honest conversations with Winston. Like we spoke about everything, like before we even decided to step into this. Mm. I asked all of the questions that I had, you know, what do you think sex will look like? How do you think life will be different for us? All of those things so that I could have the confidence that like, okay, we can do this. Yeah, and I think the other thing that my wife really did, which might help someone listening to this is mm -hmm. she she looked for representation so she went on youtube for example mm, and point. she looked for other couples with our dynamic yeah and just kind of through following their stories getting to see that actually this this can be a loving and fulfilling marriage yeah and i think that's part of the reason why we didn't know at the time that we were going to step into the world of social media right but i think that that there was almost like a, a premonition yeah like a good. prophetic yeah. thing that you saw where just like somebody sharing their story mm. and just living their life in a normal way might be inspiring pockets of people all around the world to think, hey, if they can do it, then maybe it's not such a crazy idea. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And y'all are leading on so many fronts, right? Because people don't see this. People don't see a couple, you know, with building a family, yeah. sharing, being able to share and, and love on each other. And um, it's very difficult, like I was saying earlier, to, to get to that point. 
But Winston, I'm curious about you because you talked about, you know, some of the things that you internally that you were thinking, right? You're on a date with this or a, a friend date or, a friend you know, date. lunch date, whatever, whatever, right? <laughs> with this beautiful young lady, you got things going on in your head. And we have men, you know, we actually just had a, a gentleman, Will, I think it was, who called in. And he struggling with self-esteem, self-confidence, you know. So when you are date, were dating in general, how did you, you know, what was the the conversations you were having internally to make sure that you were able to overcome some of the negative or, or downtrodden thoughts that were coming across your, your mind? Yeah, gosh, yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, so I think there's something to be said here about ableism and internalized ableism. So if you're not familiar with the term, ableism is any sort of discrimination or any sort of, you know, negative attitude toward a person with a disability. And I think... That's something that almost becomes normalized through your life, mm -hmm. living with a disability. It's maybe it's relatable to racism in a way. You know, as a person who's a minority, you might find yourself in a space where you just get used to deal dealing with you know microaggressions and racism, and you just find a way to keep moving forward despite it. And I think that internalized stuff is what was affecting you know my self esteem. So, you know, as much as I had a loving family and at home I had you know, 100% support, people who believed in me, people who thought I could achieve anything I wanted to be. If I wanted to become a soccer player, they would, they would, they would back me. <laughs> 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 they would back me, but as, as soon as I stepped out of my mom's house, I then had to face up to the real world, yeah. you know, where people are looking at me like, you know, okay, what's he gonna do, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's been a big part of it, which is something that I really tried to practice with my wife, mm -hmm. is just holding that space for her to ask anything anything at all and i remember we had this kind of now famous 18 hour conversation on the phone when we were deciding whether or not we should get together and i remember preparing for that call by making a list a, a written list of all the reasons why i thought we wouldn't work mm. yeah, I remember you know that. Now i remember you know and on that list was things like you know my disability you know my you know your family might not accept me for who I am, mm -hmm. your friends might not accept me for who I am. We're not sure how the chemistry is gonna be, you know, physically, you know, in the bedroom, all of those things. You know, we still have to figure out parenthood. It was a long list. Yeah. You know, I, I was almost like, you know, my own going against what, you know, we both wanted. Mm -hmm. And I think us having that all of that stuff on the table mm -hmm. and say, okay, we're gonna look at these things one by one. And all of a sudden you realize that actually everything is figure outable. Yeah. You know, we can have a conversation with your parents mm. and you know get a gauge as to how they feel you know i remember having going over to your house for the first time yeah and i, I said to my wife's parents yeah guys i can see that you look a bit hesitant like ask me anything like i'm an open book mm -hmm. and we literally had those conversations where they were like okay cool so are you on any medication because people have all these ideas about right. disability. You know, is, is my daughter gonna have to care for your personal needs? Mm. So all of these things that are normally left unspoken, yeah. I just leaned into, let, let's just put it all on the table. Mm. So that's been the key for me. So oh. that seems like common sense. Like it just seems like the smartest thing to do before you get into this long-term relationship. Let's just discuss all the things I'm thinking about, all the things you thinking about, stuff that I know you probably don't want me to know that you are thinking about. And let's discuss it with you and let's discuss it with your family. It's very clear. That makes sense. And I think people watching be like, oh, I would have done the same thing, but I would have done the same thing if I was in y'all's situation. But I don't do the same thing in my situation. So that's that's my that's my question for you guys. Why do you think people are apprehensive, apprehensive about taking that huge leap of vulnerability with somebody they supposed to be able to spend their entire life with? Mm. Mm. I think it's that fear of rejection, right? Because when you put everything out on the table, like here's all of the things that make me a little bit difficult to love. Here are all of the things that make me maybe a little bit difficult to live with. And there's that fear of like, if I show you like the deepest part of me, if I yeah. show you all of me, you can just say no, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I, I think it comes down to that fear of rejection. Um, and I think a big part of overcoming that is I feel like especially as women like we've been blessed with like an intuition to know like this guy's safe um mm. to kind of like put it all out there and that's what I waited for like with you um 
to know, okay, this feels safe. Because yeah. I've done it in the past where I've opened up to guys and, you know, it wasn't safe. And I kind of knew that in my intuition. And then you end up in a position where you, you know, you have given someone so much of yourself and they throw it back in your face. Um, but I think when you do meet a guy and, and something about you is telling you this is safe, like it's taking a step out and like, you don't have to give the whole thing, but like a little bit, see how he treats that, see where he meets you. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I would add to that, I think the other thing for me was I learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. So I'd been in other situations, other relationships where I didn't have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I kind of hope that my situation was, would be somehow invisible to them, <laughs> right? And so we just kind of went along pretending that there was, you know, nothing that needed to be addressed, nothing that needed to be spoken about until the point where it was like, okay, well, I'm not sure if my parents want to meet you because I've shown them a picture and they don't think that you are the right person that I should be dating. Mm -hmm. And so this is like a year into the relationship now. And wow. you're kind of, yeah. Wow. So, so now you're kind of like, okay, well, that was a waste of time. And Maybe. so through having my fingers burnt several times, it got to a point where, you know, I learned the hard way. And so by the time I met my wife, it was like, you know, if this is going to fail, let it fail fast, but I'm going to do it the right way. And you guys, for clarity for the audience, you've been married for three years yeah. and you guys dated for six months prior to the proposal. Yeah. And at what point did you whip out that list? Like, when did you pull the list out and say, all right, well, look, here's my list of things <laughs> right. that I'm concerned about. Because you said, because right. that's that's a model we actually live by too in business is like yeah. fail fast. Yeah. Like yeah. we're going to do it. Let's just go all in. And if we felt, let's not stretch this out. You yeah. identify the opportunities, the weaknesses, the threats, yeah. the strengths, everything out, the out front. Uh -huh. So when did you when, when did you bring that tough conversation to the forefront? Yeah, so I guess in terms of timeline, we got we started dating in, I want to say November 2019. It could be December yeah. around that time. Mm -hmm. And so that was the time when the list came out. So that's the time when I said, like, here's all the things. And we spoke about, you know, all the different issues and we also met your parents yeah and we met your pastor as well uh -huh. you know fairly fairly quickly um yeah. in in that month in that first month of dating yeah um but it was kind of after because i think so we, we had that event and i think i was feeling something and because we were friends i wasn't sure if you were feeling the same thing yeah. but um you kept kind of i call it flanter <laughs> flirty banter like he was kind of like oh like just saying stuff that i was like hey, you're kind of flirting with me here um, but I needed upfrontness. Like I needed yeah, to know how true. you felt. So I think I spoke to him and I was like, okay, I'm kind of feeling something here and you're kind of giving me some signals, but let's just have a conversation mm. for clarity. And then it was at that point that he was like, yeah, I'm feeling something too. But here are all of the reasons yeah. why I don't think we should move forward <laughs> and all mm. of the things that I think we need to talk about before we both kind of give our hearts to this. Yeah. So that was a big conversation before we said, okay, we're doing this. Yeah. But what, like with, with you, it's, it's just incredible because did you have, what prepped you to be open to this, mm -hmm. right? Like, did you have past relationships where you may have learned mm -hmm. that, you know, what you wanted already wasn't right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you just kind of, just what, what prepped you for that situation? Yeah, oh, that's such a good question. And... I, so I, I've never dated anyone with a disability. It's not something that I, like I didn't even know too much about Winston's disability before I met him. Um, but I have like dated guys in the past who like fit everything physically that I was like, yeah, this is a 10, like, you know, six foot, has a six pack, like everything, right? Um, thinking like, yeah, this is like, I've hit the jackpot. Like this guy ticks all of the boxes and it didn't work out. So maybe like that was kind of a thing where like that kind of shattered my illusions. And I had my face, you know, I went to New York, did my thing, dated, like did all of those things. Um, and it shattered that illusion that like, you know, I'm gonna be happier with someone like who fits society's standard of perfect. So I think I'd already let go of that. Um, and also I think it was the fact that I, I knew my purpose. Like by the time I met Winston, I knew exactly like what God put me on this earth to do. And I knew that I mm. needed a part beyond aesthetics, beyond someone who could take the trash out and bench however many kgs in the gym. I knew I needed someone like who would partner me with, partner with me in what God wanted me to do on this earth. And that was the number mm. one thing. Um, 
So when I met Winston, I kind of just, I, I knew that that was it because I was so in tune with my purpose. Um, that's a gem right there. It was. That's, that's heavy. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> when you are aligned with what you're supposed to be doing, it makes decision making a lot easier. A hundred percent. And I think that should be a prelude for anyone trying to get into a serious relationship is, do I know who I am? Because you can pick a partner based off of whatever phase of life you're in now and then a year later they're not the right person so i think yeah. before you even think about marriage you have to know what your purpose is because one day you wake up and you do realize your purpose is to travel to africa and like you know help children in need and your partner's like well i'm, I'm trying to stay right here and live a quiet life and then there's that mismatch and now you have to pick between doing what god put you on this earth for and being with your partner, but you shouldn't have to pick between those. The person that you're with is with that too. Like yeah. we were in London at the time and I always said like, I see myself moving to America. And he was like, I see the same thing. But mm. with someone else who we hadn't had that discussion for and I didn't know like where in the world God was calling me to. Now we end up in a position where it's like, yeah, I, I feel like I need to move to Atlanta. And he's like, well, I'm trying to stay in London. Mm. Then you're like, how do you pick? Man, you know, it's, it's interesting because when I'm hearing this conversation, even what you said prior about talking to the people special to you, I can imagine another major thing people struggle with is if somebody that they have near and dear and special, just like the young lady that you said, she showed the picture to maybe her parent and they said, no, this is not the person that can immensely deter you from doing whatever it is. That's pursuing a career or a person, whatever it might be. Anything. Mm -hmm. So yeah. did you have anybody that was close or special to you mm -hmm. that actually was giving feedback that was discouraging you mm -hmm. from moving forward that you may have had to overcome yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> how did you handle yeah, that though because yeah. I, I know that that ha that's that happens quite often yeah. with men and women and if they don't know who they are or not tuned in enough with their partner they could be debated out of you know a, a relationship mm -hmm. so without I, any investigation mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. like you said they Someone's see a picture because we're we're so physically motivated that without any further investigation, we gonna make a decision and give counsel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is <laughs> right, right. That's all another issue. Yeah. <laughs> so I think for me it was because I, I remember specifically there was like one girlfriend who I had that was like, yeah, this is what I'm thinking about, and she was like, are you sure about this? Like, are you sure about what's that gonna mean? Like, we're having children, this, this, that. But I think I'd already seen in my life how a lot of the things that. Um, I felt called to do, people didn't get it at first. So like I said, like I was studying for my law degree, I was gonna be a lawyer and you know, obviously that's what my parents wanted. And I woke up one day and I was like, actually like, I wanna be a life coach and I wanna drop out of uni for a year and just travel to New York, barely had any money. And everyone was like, are you sure? Like maybe you should just finish your degree, didn't get it. Um, but I did it anyway, worked out, people came around. Um, so many things like I have evidence in my life of like I feel like God gives you the vision first and it's almost like you have to run with it first and be okay with people catching up afterwards so I think I already had that mindset that there's going to be certain things I think people who do the most amazing things in life they get the vision first mm. and you kind of have to be willing to run with it even when it seems crazy to everyone else so I already had that experience like in my business and in my personal life so I knew with this too um, it might be the same situation where like I'm the only one who has the vision first um, and that's why like we I, I had to be secure in this that's why we had those tough conversations and I had to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the man that I had next to me was strong enough to overcome all of those oppositions with me so that if it came down to it and it was us against the world you know we could do that luckily like most of the people that I told him were close to me were supportive, but I did have one or two people who were like, mm, I'm not sure. And to be honest, most of those people, like it ended up just revealing itself that those weren't even people that were for me in the mm. first place. Mm. So. Mm. Wow. wow. So they, they just got weeded out. <laughs> yeah. Like just through like, di like almost unrelated things. Like it was like, wow, like you're really not just for me. Apart, anyway, yeah. yeah. Cause I don't think God won't, if someone's supposed to be in your life, God won't let them like be separate from you. Like it, it it just won't work that way. Like God knows who you need in your life. You mm. know, it's the destiny helpers that you need to get to where you're trying to get to. Um, yeah. So I knew if this was my husband, the people that were going to be close to me would be, would get it too, even if it wasn't straight away at first. And they also <laughs> needed to have those conversations with you. Yeah. And, and I think there's a, 
like for me an important spiritual confirmation here yeah because i'd always felt that the person who i end up with was gonna have to be a rebel in some way mm. because this this is not mainstream like this is right. not it's not what you see on instagram it's not what you see on tv i even said those exact words in my in my wedding vows mm -hmm. to you and yeah. so i think when we had those conversations and you know went through the big list of scary things mm -hmm. and you were like okay let's let's go see my parents let's go speak to my pastor let's let's do all of these things yeah and you, okay i have my rebel now got my rebel mm -hmm. so you know that's the w w from what i've heard because obviously i'm not married but after the marriage you know and all the dust settles fairy tales, yeah. fairy tales over with mm. things can get pretty real mm. did you guys like run into some challenges that you may not have expected or that you may not have prepared yourself for in marriage or you know were the challenges just about all what you they were pretty much what you thought they were going to be yeah good question i think maybe a surprising one for us was communication yeah because, you know, I mean, I'm a speaker and you do life, life coaching and you speak mm -hmm. to a lot of people anyway. We both done podcasts, you know, TV interviews. So, so we're quite well versed mm -hmm. in communicating. That was until we got married and then had to figure out how to communicate with each other. Yeah. And so initially there was there were challenges mm -hmm. because we were, we were having conflict. But we hadn't figured out how to see each other yeah. in a conflict. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that was kind of breaking down what what I need and what you need to mm -hmm. feel like we've got to a better place right. in conflict resolution. So for me, that was a surprising one because I, I was almost, you know, I was almost boastful before, like, yeah, hey, like, communicate. everyone's like, communication, communication, communication. Yeah, like, yeah, that's exactly. not going to be we a thing this. for us. <laughs> <laughs> like, we'll be fine. We'll be fine right. with that. There'll be other issues, but not that one. Yeah, definitely. And I think we went through a lot of, like, big life things yeah. pretty early on in our marriage um so losing winston's mom passed yeah. away three months into our marriage and that was a whole dynamic like balancing grief in your marriage and like me kind of being new into your family and figuring out how can i support you yeah. and, and, and be there for you in like the darkest time in your life um having kids too like having a baby like as a woman that like does so much to your body to your brain to your hormones so we had a lot of big life things that like um we had to work through um yeah now that's so, that's a good one actually because i'm curious about that while we're there yeah when you talk about obviously you guys you guys have one one child so yeah, far yeah we have a daughter a, a daughter yeah. how old is she by the way she's gonna be two nearly two, yeah. Yeah. two. Mm -hmm. dope so y'all had your daughter about a year into the marriage yeah so what does for you guys in particular like what does intimacy look like in your relationship yeah it's a good question and i think it's something that uh we get a lot of questions about like we've had like a, yeah we have like a, a tiktok like, <laughs> 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 what's it like shit right but we also love speaking about it because i think like for our relationship and marriage in general, like intimacy and sex is so important and it's like a glue. Yeah. Um, so I think it does it in terms of what intimacy actually looks like, it probably doesn't look as different as people might think, but we definitely have to lean into like communication. Um, Cause there's, there's no such thing as being good at sex. It's just knowing your partner and knowing their body. And that's the only thing we've had to lean into me yeah. understanding your body yeah. as someone with a disability and you understanding my body as well. So we have, we're heavy on the communication about sex um, and we prioritize it. Um, like we make it a priority like in our marriage because we know how powerful it is. Um, but yeah, communication probably maybe uh, more so than other couples has had mm. to be big for us, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of understanding, you know, what's possible, what's not possible. And yeah. 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 And I mean, there are things that look slightly different, obviously, to the average couple. Yeah. And I think we try to be intentional about you know like you say learning each other's bodies mm -hmm. but being proactive with it so right. obviously we believe in not having sex until after marriage but we had this season where we were dating for six months right mm. and so of course we're attracted to each other and we don't want to cross that boundary but we still also want to try and prepare ourselves so that when the time comes yeah we kind of no hit, hit the ground running so to speak <laughs> <laughs> y'all already warmed up <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. ryan knows ryan knows <laughs> <laughs> and so like i mean a, a little thing about something that we've spoken about before is 
you know, like my wife wanted to get comfortable around my, my chair, mm -hmm. right? And so I remember, you know, when we were dating, for example, she'd just come and sit on my lap, right? And that sounds kinky. It, 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 it sounds a lot kinkier <laughs> than it is, but just, just to be comfortable with, you know, mm. someone yeah, who... Yeah, it's a part of your life. Yeah, because, you know, maybe for the average person, you used to be ar being around someone who's, you know, upright, and now you're having to interact with someone who's in a sitting position mm -hmm. most of the time. So what does that look like? Does it mean, you know, me leaning on your chair? Does it mean I can, I can maybe squeeze up and sit next to you? So all of those little things kind of broke down walls that I feel like would have been harder to break down on, you know, wedding night. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow, it's just oh. amazing. Because the, like, y'all's dynamic, it really forces you to do all of the best practices that make a relationship yes. healthy. Mm -hmm. Over communicate. Yeah. Over communicate, yeah. right, which is what a lot of us are, are missing. Um, but you mentioned, this is important, because I think this has been something we talked about on the show quite a bit. And we got the people who watch the show, it's like split half and half about sex before marriage. So why did you guys decide to hold off, um, to abstain from sex until you get married? What, why was that important? Hmm. Um, I think part of it was we wanted to be as clear headed as possible um, before kind of like making that commitment because sex is powerful um, and it's designed to kind of, it's honestly like amazing. Even like when we have like a communication difficulty or there's something like, after I just had a baby, it was so hard for you to understand where I was. But through that, it was like, okay, like, it kind of just reconnected us. So I think that's beautiful, like, when you have the commitment of marriage to know that, like, that person's there. But I think it can be dangerous, like, before marriage or even, whether it's in a casual sense or before you truly have that commitment, because you're kind of joining yourself to this person and it can stop you from seeing things that actually you should be looking at. It can stop you from seeing things that are actually, you know, whatever you want to call them, signs that like maybe there's something here that's not quite right that you need to look at because sex is so powerful and it can really join to that. Especially as a woman, like, you can not even like the guy, you have sex with him and it's like, I think I love him. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, I, I think for us, we wanted to be clear-headed, I don't know the same thing was for you yeah no i agree and i think we also believe that sex is not just physical there's an emotional and a spiritual layer to it as well which kind of speaks to the depth that my wife is is sharing about and mm -hmm. i think we just wanted to be very protective of that yeah. and also from a biblical perspective you know sex is sacred mm. and should be preserved for the context of marriage and that's something that we both believed in personally and also growing up with christian values mm. wow so you would recommend that somebody who's out here dating, they, regardless of religious practice or whatever, that's something they might need to practice in order to have success in their decision making. I think it's a good idea. <clears throat> mm. um, I say it's like, especially for women, because like I said, like it. Um, I mean, I don't want to generalize, but I think sex is so attached to like our emotions, mm. um, and I think you want to make a, a decision that's right for you, not just right now, but a decision that is right for you like in 10 years time and 20 years time and it, it can be really hard to make those decisions when you have that added element um in the in the relationship yeah and, and that kind of reminds me of something we spoke about before we started recording about you know a, a scenario that somebody shared you know that they were in a relationship but the guy said he didn't want to commit to them right or something and i think that that's for me is a typical example when you find yourself in situations that don't make sense. Log logically, they don't make sense. Mm. But then, you know, if you ask yourself, is sex involved in this relationship? The answer is probably yes. And when sex is involved, then even simple choices that you should be making, harder. They, they become harder mm. because now you're thinking, okay, I know he doesn't like me. I know he doesn't treat me right, but yeah, it's I feel sex. This connection, yeah. <laughs> and, and so you're kind of trying to rationalize the irrationalizable. Yeah. And so for us, it's really helped with that clarity and knowing that we're truly aligned with our purpose. Yeah. And I think a concern that people have with that, like I've heard the whole try before you buy thing and yeah. no one wants to be locked into a marriage <laughs> where like the sex is whack. But it's again, like I don't think and we've really learned this is a such thing as being bad at sex. It's just communicating and understanding like your partner's body and being willing to grow and I think marriage also gives you that foundation that like we can take our time with this like we can really learn each other um and again I think if God leads you to someone 
uh, the sex won't be whack if you work at it because this is your partner. Like, you know, sex is supposed to be good um, within marriage, but it's more communication than like, anything else and more like taking the time to really prioritize it um so yeah so winston i want to give the initiate some context about that conversation we were having but so guys we get emails on a daily basis multiple times a day and a lot of times it's questions uh, of course email us at info at harleyinitiated.com but one of the questions that we regularly get is always typically the same scenario is hey i'm dealing with a great guy phenomenal guy I asked him if he's interested in being in a relationship. He says he is not interested in a relationship or he's not interested in being in a relationship with me. What should I do? We get some variation of that same question multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious because it sounds like you guys were operating from a very intentional place to have dated for six months and then go ahead and tie the knot. So when the when a young lady asks a man, are you interested in a relationship? Do you want a relationship or whatever vari variation of that question? What is the response of a man who is serious about dating that woman? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I think for me, I'd kind of, I reached a place where I, I knew that the next relationship I wanted to be in was for life. So it was marriage. So I was in, I think previously when I got into relationships, it's kind of for, uh, my thought process was, I just want to date this person. I want to see how it goes. Or at most, I want you to be my girlfriend, mm -hmm. right? And then let's see how it goes. Let's see if we like each other. Let's see, you know, friends like, like you, family likes you, all of that stuff. But when I met my wife, it was, I was already thinking, you know, I want to make this work and I want to make this for life. Mm -hmm. And so the kind of, you know, conversations that we we're having, you know, to kind of go back to what we said initially, were about those things that really matter. So mm -hmm. what is our joint purpose together? You know, what does family dynamics look like, family values? Right. Um, how can we help each other grow, you know, not just in, in business and, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the relationship, but yeah. also spiritually as well. Mm -hmm. You know, how are we going to pray together, pray for each other? What's the kind of culture we want to have when we have kids? You know, what do we want our kids' values to be? Are we going to homeschool? Yeah. Yeah. You know, are we going to let our kids, uh, our kids just go in the mainstream and you know, learn whatever is available out there. Mm. So it's those kind of, I guess you could call them like four life questions. You're not thinking about not just next month or next year, you're thinking like questions for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah, mm. and you'll know, like as a woman, like you will know, because it's just so different, like how you were, and like you said, like those four life questions that you were asking and that commitment that you showed me off the bat, it was so different to anyone else that I'd, kind of been with so I think if there's a question mark on like is he committed either by his words or his actions I, I think that's enough like you'll just know like when a guy wants to be with you he wants to marry you he sees you as his partner for life the mother of his kids all of those um you'll know <laughs> yeah because <laughs> it'll make it clear right yeah and I just remembered one little example of something that I used to do previously yeah I would never take a girl home to meet my mom my mom's so important to me mm -hmm. and so it was like no i need to be sure mm -hmm. i need to date this girl for like eight years before i take her to my <laughs> <mom>. <laughs> but with you that was like you know because there was that knowing and that spiritual confirmation it was like I, I can't wait for you to meet my mom and let's make it happen asap yeah i'm curious about this too because you know typically we do hear you know uh society will speak they want the man to be the provider the protect and the priest of the household so does that look differently, you know, for you guys or is, you know, have have you evolved what it means to have a man in the household at all? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely getting married, like a lot of those things are really important to me, like to have a man who leads, um, to have a man who uh, takes ownership of making sure like we're good, we're covered, like we've got a roof over our heads, we can do all of those things. Um, and Winston meets all of those things. Um, I think the one thing that like, again, like we get a lot of questions online is like, oh, like, can he protect you like physically? Um, and I think for most times, like people blow that kind of out, out of proportion because how many times are you in a position where you physically need someone like to protect you? Like probably not that many times. 
Um, and I think protection, more so on a daily basis. Yeah, protection, physical protection is important and there's things that we do to kind of balance that. And I've had to shift and um, shift my mindset on things like that. But I think for a woman, emotional protection is really important too. Like when you're in a situation where yeah. things are, t even financially, like we've had times where like we've had no money, like, cause we've been building a business. But I've always felt like the person that I'm with has me, like he'll never let us go without a roof over our head. Like he'll, um, He's just like so responsible. Like he, like even if I'm like, oh, I want to do fancy dates, this, this, that, he'll be like, hey, I know you want to do this now, but I'm thinking about where, what we're gonna need in two months' time. So I always feel protected in that sense and protected emotionally. And I think day to day, those are the things that are more important. I'm not invalidating like the the desire for a woman to feel protected physically, but I think if we're honest, day to day, like. You know, you don't need a six foot guy to kind of like, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, it's some, some very manly things that you're doing there, which is I think the main thing is sticking to the script, is communicating even against, even if your spouse is not going to be happy about the decision, you still making the decision that's best for y'all and the family. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that takes a lot of courage. Let me tell y'all last night. So last night, I went up, so my birthday is this Friday, November 24th, day after Thanksgiving, right? So my boy, he hits me up and he's like, yo, come over, you know, we're going to relax, you know, watch the game. So I'm hanging out over his house and he's like, yo, I'm hungry. Let's get some food. He's like, what do you want? And I'm like, it's my birthday week. I want a pepperoni pizza. You know, <laughs> I don't even eat pork, by the way, but like pepperoni pizza is like my birthday cake every year. I'm like, I'm going to indulge maybe one or two of them. Right. <laughs> so we go to the to Papa John's to order the pizza, go to Papa John's and I go to the window. And this is a guy, you know, he's a big guy, maybe he's like 6'2", but he's got a great big old belly, like one of the retirement <laughs> bellies. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Man. And he sees, it's a, it's a cutie, a young, young cutie comes up to us and, and comes to the window to get the pizza. And he's like, oh man, she, she's, boy, boy, back in my day, you know, give me, me, me one of those. And I'm like, oh yeah, she, she nice, you know, right? I got my pizza. And he was like, man, he was like, listen, if I could tell a young man anything, just be careful with the one you pick, right? And I'm like, okay, appreciate you. I'm trying to go. And he go, it's like, it was on his heart. He goes into this, this story about how he was married for 10 years and he had a disability. He got disabled, military vet. And he talked about how just very quickly, yeah, you know, she soon as I soon soon as you know I couldn't work, she done changed on me, you know, and you know, and it kind of got to where I can surmise based on what he was saying that his wife left him at some point. We got a disability, but his life lesson to me and my boy was you should be careful about the person you pick. Mm. Okay, now I also figured out from what he's saying, he's pretty much like this grumpy old single dude, you know, who got two pieces that he looked like he was probably about to share for himself, <laughs> right? And I was, and my, my, my buddy, we got two different things from that. Cause my buddy is like, yeah, man, he right, man. You know, some of these women and this and that. And I'm like, is that the lesson that this dude wanted to teach? Because to me, he was really, you know, detailing that when he fell on bad times, he didn't do what was needed to pick himself back up. Mm. And the result was his wife being dissatisfied and later leaving, right? So Winston, this question is more so for you. What do you tell that man who just lost his job, who is now disabled from some work catastrophe or some situation, or who's just in a place to where he is lost and depressed or highly anxious? What do you tell that man to help him get out of that situation and to not end up, you know, 20 <laughs> years later, single, fat, and getting eating two pieces for yourself? Right, right. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And and it's tough, first of all, because we've all been in those moments when you felt like, you just felt down, you just felt yeah, like everything was against know. you. And I know I know I have as well. Um, I think for me, when I'm in, I guess you could call it a crisis. In a crisis, it's sometimes it's very difficult to, to find any positivity in a crisis. So I kind of hesitate to kind of give the, the motivational advice of, Mm. Just pick yourself up. You can do it. You know, just go find a job or do something different. Mm. But I feel like a couple of things I would share is, first of all, community. Yeah. So plugging yourself into the right community. And, you know, that doesn't have to be, you know, just because you became disabled, you need to plug yourself into, like, Disabled Vets Association. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it helps you, then that's great. 
But I think it's just having people that pick you up on those days mm -hmm. when you don't feel like you can do it yourself. Yeah. And just having someone like you who we can call on and say, hey, bro, let's get go get another two pizzas or something. Right. <laughs> right. And so that's one thing. And then I think the other thing is, I guess, doing the inner work yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that inner work can look like, and this is something that I've been leaning into, we've both been leaning into in the past couple of years. So something like therapy. Yeah. So that safe space to talk to someone and actually express those things that are mm. you know potentially eating you up inside but maybe you don't feel so comfortable sharing with the boys um and when i'm really really having a bad day like those type of days when you don't want to get out of bed you just don't want to speak to anybody mm. i think for me i just try to think of one thing which is like what's the next right thing i can do yeah. right and sometimes the next right thing can look like i'm gonna brush my teeth Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a shower. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to send that email that I've been putting off for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And just do what, that one thing mm -hmm. and see whether or not that gives you momentum. Oh, I think that's a good one because I've had days like that where, you know, this was some time ago, but I would just sleep on the couch all day. Then it would get like six o'clock. I would finally take a shower and I would think to myself, Man, I feel good. You know, if I would have took a shower at yeah. 10 o'clock this morning, I probably would have had a much better day. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been a different day. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So I know I know what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to ask y'all this for the people, man, because um, I'm not sure what's on y'all hearts here. But y'all, I mean, y'all are such a powerful couple in, in just even where you guys are now at at three years of marriage. Um I, th I think that doesn't really even speak to where you guys are because you you guys have probably had to put in work within this three years yeah. <laughs> that couples at year 10 may not even had to even see or even or may have even ignored. Yeah, because it's some things even like what you stated on day one conversations you guys couldn't avoid yeah. to really get to the next level, which is why I think you got your relationship is just so powerful in general in what it personifies. So what would you tell, because you see the kind of culture we're in right now, like we're in, we're struggling, especially as a community. We're struggling in that of family, marriage, love, dating. It's a big problem for us. And if we don't fix this, the next generation is going to get hit heavily. The next few generations Even actually worse. are going to, we're going to see the ripple effects of that. What would your advice be to a young man or woman that's in this dating market right now and experiencing that struggle? That's a good question. I think it's something that we think about a lot now because it's like left, right, and center. You hear about, oh, this person's divorced and like this happened to this marriage and it's sad because yeah. mm -hmm. it's like a family <laughs> off the back of that. Um, and I think the advice that I would say is like, you want to realize the weight of what it is that you're doing. Because especially when you're just like, dating you're thinking oh, okay i'm just seeing someone um but i think for us it was really thinking like well this is the person who i pick is going to affect the next generation it's going to affect my children it's going to affect their children's children and so on and so forth so i think it's like sitting with that for a second is like this is bigger than me this is bigger than like having someone to cuddle at night this is um what's the foundation that my children are gonna have right um and it's like taking on that responsibility like for me like i knew i, I needed to marry a man like who i could build a family with a healthy family with because that's going to affect them and that's going to affect the people that they pick um and i was it was really on my mind like to, to to break the cycles that i had seen and i knew the person that i would be with and marrying was directly linked to that and i think a lot of the times we don't think about those questions we just ask, am I happy? And that's an important question. Like you want to be happy in your relationship, but that can't be the only question that you ask. Yeah. It can't even be the most important question that mm. you ask. It's a question that you ask. But for a lot of us, you're dating and you're like, am I happy in this? Like, does he make me feel this way? Not, is this someone that I can build with? Is this someone that I can break generational curses with? Is this someone that I can change my lineage with? Mm. Is this someone who's going to call me to be the best and highest version of myself? We don't even ask those questions. Yeah. And then you kind of wonder why we end up where we end up because we're asking really shallow questions that just don't go deep enough for the person who's going to affect all of these generations to come. We have to ask good questions. Yeah, mm. yeah, I would definitely agree. And I think 
something else that I noticed in our story mm -hmm. is that there was, before we got together, there was a season of, I guess, self-discovery yeah. is what I would say. Mm. So I hadn't been in a relationship for about three or four years mm -hmm. before I met you. And you were, you know, in a season where you were not looking yeah. to get into a relationship at the time. And during those journeys of self-discovery, mm. we're both doing a lot of inner work. So I was, you know, addressing traumas, addressing things that I never expressed before. You know, I was kind of coming up with a value system for what I wanted my next relationship to look like. Mm. And so I think that inner work is something that a lot of us skip because we hop from one relationship to the next. Mm. And that's where you end up in a place where you're in a relationship or you're in a situation ship, but there's no, there's no bigger picture. There's no, yeah. there's no purpose. There's no culture. There's, mm -hmm. there's nothing to keep you guys committed for the next 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so I would definitely encourage anyone listening to this. If you haven't, and you know, I was going to say, if you feel like you can, but I think you should do it, mm -hmm. you know, just take that time to have that introspection yeah. and really figure out what your, your own value system is yeah. before diving into the next thing. Mm. Mm. Man. Now, I wanted to ask you this uh, real quick, Mayfair, because you, you know, I'm sure you guys post, like you said, you when you initially posted a thing, pictures of your wedding, you said that went viral. Yeah. So, I, trust me, we know what going viral means. Yeah. It's a full spectrum of the amount you get the people mm -hmm. who absolutely love you and you just get people who are psychotic yeah. and just absolutely hate Straight you for no person. reason. Yeah. Right. For it's no a whole, reason. It's a, for no reason. Mm -hmm. It's a whole ecosystem that you built. And I can imagine that a lot of the comments you guys were probably getting is he must be rich. He must be loaded with cash. Fly. He must have flew a private jet to come sit down with Harley <laughs> Initiated. Right. But clearly over this interview, you guys have detailed the many other things outside of finances, which makes this relationship dynamic special. Right. Now, my thing is we have a conversation a lot about the finances in general, though about how a man may not have a certain level of finances throughout the relationship, what a woman may have to do some things to remind him that he's that guy still, mm -hmm. or in a situation where the man may come in with less finances, it's still that situation where the woman and the man have to do things to make sure things stay in place. The man stays a man, the woman stays a woman. So with this physical dynamic between you guys being much different from the traditional couple, are there things that you have to do as a woman to remind Winston that, hey, you still my man regardless of the yeah. situation? Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think definitely. Um, even like little things, just like showing him that like I do like need him. I mean, like I, I take out the trash, like I do most of <laughs> right, like, right. the heavy lifting, <laughs> like I go to the gym, make sure like I'm able to like do those things. Um, but it's just, I mean, I think it's like more personal, like even just letting him lead like on decisions or if he says like, sometimes like he'll say, okay, let's do this. Or like, let's take this route if we're driving here. And I'm like, why? And it's like, just trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, just trust me, babe. And I'm like, okay, cool. I trust you. So I, yeah, I do like, I'm intentional about making sure he knows I trust him and respect him. Um, and I think that's a big thing that like, even we thought we, we were, we had down, like I respect my man. Cause I, for men, respect is really important. Um, yeah. And for women, love is important. Mm -hmm. uh, like almost to, like as much as a woman needs love, a man needs respect. Mm -hmm. And I think I really mm -hmm. recognize that in the beginning, that respect is really important to my husband. Um, and he'll remind me of that. Um, so I think it's like being open to that and being open to him saying like, hey, like when you said this like that, that felt this way to me mm -hmm. and hearing that. Um, so I don't know, I think it's respect as I see it, but also asking him, like, what does respect look like to you mm -hmm. in this season? And just asking him, like, how do I show you that I respect you and value you as my man? Mm -hmm. um, and being open to, to hearing that rather than like guessing, because it's different for every guy, right? Right. Um, and you have to know what respect looks like for your man. What, what does that look like for you, Winston? What does respect look like? <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, I think my wife does a great job. And I was going to say, you know, sometimes it's not even the things that, you know, that are easy to kind of put a finger on. But yeah. it could be situations where I'm listening to my wife talking to her best friend or her mom. Mm -hmm. I'm just in the other room doing my own thing on the computer. And I know there's a situation, for example, we might be going through a financial hardship. Mm -hmm. And her mom will ask, you know, hey, how are you guys doing? So yeah, everything's fine, you know, really provided for, really looked after. And, you know, she's not saying that to lie, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but it is true like we have what we need for now whereas you know another way to approach that conversation would be like oh god like you know <laughs> we're struggling again <laughs> like this this guy's not making enough money like blah 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 so it's it's those almost intangible things that really fill me up and really help me recommit because i know that my partner is with me we're on the same team mm -hmm. even when we're in the t trenches so that's really valuable to me mm. wow that's so at this point like what, what's the future how many like do, do you guys want more kids like you want to expand your family what's the what's the goals there yeah i definitely like i would say i'm ready for babies but he's more <laughs> like <laughs> you put him on the spot with that one i yeah. did, I did <laughs> put him on the spot. i'm the more like like let's do this now like i'm more like adventurous okay, she's being ready she's yeah. Okay. yeah okay but that's yeah. how that ever like yeah. it's like a yin yeah. and yang like yeah. i'm more like okay like let's do this now and he's more like okay we're gonna do this but let's make sure we got a big enough house <laughs> let's make sure we got the finances let's make sure we got you know a car and all of these things yeah um, some masculine feminine energy though. yeah right. 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 he, he right. sounds just like me <laughs> yeah. hold on hold on hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> 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 so yeah definitely more kids and i think um you know we're pretty new to atlanta we've been here for about a year we moved from london so yeah. i think just building community here as well is like big for us like Massive, with like-minded yeah. people um and just kind of setting roots here like we see ourselves here for a while so we're excited to kind of just set some roots um grow our family and keep growing our business keep um, spreading our message to, to different people. I mean, like we have, our audience typically looks a certain way, um, but we want to reach people who even look different to us, like people who are outside of like mm -hmm. our community. Um, and even just the other day we were walking around and like just this like white girl like <laughs> was like, oh my gosh, I've seen you guys on TikTok. And I like watch your YouTube videos. And that's the goal. Like we want more right. people to have seen this dynamic and interabled couple. So that when another couple, like one of them is in a wheelchair and the other isn't, there's not that staring or assumptions because like we've, they've already seen it in us. Yeah. Um, and we hope that kind of like gives back the dignity that everyone respects, that everyone deserves. Um, because I mean, disability is such a big thing. Like most people in their lives will end up with some form of disability and in the flash mm -hmm. that can happen. So we want, we want it to be clear that like, you know, everyone deserves dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to just do that through through creating more content, through speaking about our lives, just sharing like the everyday. Well, let me tell you, the message and what you guys represent is absolutely yeah. necessary. And uh, I appreciate you guys for coming up on here and, and talking to us. I want to make sure you let the audience know because y'all got a, again, y'all got a channel where y'all putting out content showing really bringing people into the day in the life because they yes. hitting us up and they yeah. like yo y'all got to get this couple on the show so y'all are having that impact mm -hmm. and um I, and remind me the type of it's the the type of couple interable inter interable inter couple yeah. yeah so clearly from the outside you can see that it's a difference mm -hmm. but the thing about it is when two people get together it you, you everybody is completely different yeah right exactly. it's everybody's completely different i think if we operated with some of those same uh principles that you got in the way that you guys operate in your relationship we will all have more healthy relationships mm -hmm. and um because i mean it's people walking around that you know emotionally this this emotional mm -hmm. disability yeah. Yeah. violent <laughs> angry right can't control the emotions so depressed. we all got depressed we all got problems uh -huh. right so I, I think the the what you guys are doing is, is really phenomenal so can you let the audience know where they can find you and your content as well? Please let them know. Yeah. So uh, the Clements, pretty much on anything. If you type the Clements on YouTube, the Clements on TikTok, on Instagram, we'll be there. We also have a podcast called The Two and Ten Thousand Podcast, which is really where we kind of take people behind the scenes on like what they see with the day in their life and the funny little TikToks. And hmm. we really talk about what makes this this. Um, we advocate for marriages yeah. and like, we believe marriages and family are like important and foundational to a society that just achieves amazing things. So that's what we really talk about on the two and 10,000 podcast. Um, and you can find us on Patreon. It's a Patreon only podcast. So it's like a fully membership based podcast. So we can really go deep with our people. Um, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think community is such a big thing, which is why Father was so thankful to be able to come here and yeah, be a part of amazing. this and connect with people in Atlanta. And it's also, 
what we're trying to build through the Tour 10,000 platform. Mm -hmm. So it's not just going to be a podcast, but we hope to have meetups and get-togethers yeah. and really get ourselves integrated in this new new neighborhood of ours. Yeah. Facts, <laughs> facts. Well, look, we're excited for you guys. We're excited. We definitely going to be watching. And we're going to be watching you guys grow. So much blessings. Y'all see how to get in contact with this amazing couple. So definitely, I recommend you tap in with them. And we'll also have some information, the Instagram linked here in the description and the to channel. go ahead and check them out. But other than that, thank you so much for tuning into another episode of Harley Initiated. My initiates, I want you. We, as you guys know, the initiates, we have a channel membership here. We want you guys to join. You guys are letting us know what kind of guests to bring. That's why we have this couple here, is because this is who you requested. And we look, we lean on your requests. We lean on your topics. You guys are the North Star of the channel. So keep giving it to us. And please, new initiates, continue to join the family. Because we're going to continue doing bigger and better things just for you guys. But as you already know, Hardly Initiated, we are out. <laughs>